Okay, uh, everybody, welcome to our lecture with Professor George Jacobs from uh, Singapore. Uh, thank you very much, Pro Professor George Jacobs, for being available to give <coughs> a lecture to our students, our undergraduate and postgraduate students of English education at uh, University of uh, Bengkulu. I still remember that the last time you uh, gave a lecture to our students, I think it was uh, in 2015. And since then, uh, we have never met. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I first time met Professor J Jacobs at IRELC, -E Regional English Language Center in Singapore, when I attended a short uh, a short training short course. Short course on English for Business and Technology, uh, EBT. Yeah. It was in 1995. Wow. 1995. Mm -hmm. 1995. Yeah, wow. 1995. Yeah. And I still remember that uh, Professor J Jacobs yeah, asked me to uh, memorize the names of all participants. Yeah, there, are, uh, there were about 45 of them all. <laughs> and then, and I could do that. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> but now I cannot do that anymore. <laughs> Memorizing people's names. And and uh, okay. Professor J Jacobs uh, uh, said, yeah, when I mentioned my name, oh, are you uh, Safnil, the one who published an article in guidelines journals? Yeah, because before that, I published an article in guidelines journals. And everybody look at me yeah, as if uh, I am an expert on English teaching. <laughs> but actually, uh, it was only an article. Actually, I sent the article to uh, John Honeyfield. Yeah? Do you know John Honeyfield? Do you remember, uh, Prof. Uh, Jacobs? Uh, yeah, the name rings a bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, he is from, he was teaching at Ikip Padang before when I was a student oh. there. Yeah, so uh, he was my lecturer, actually. So I sent the article to him and asked him to uh, edit it and revise it and publish it. And he, he did it. He's a very nice uh, person. Uh, yeah, and, and the second time I went to RELC is to uh, do research yeah, with uh, Jack Richard. And I met uh, jo uh, Jacobs there as well. Um, George Jacobs will present the talk about learner autonomy and cooperative learning, a good match. Uh, I think this is a very important uh, topic yeah, because now in Indonesia, uh, learner autonomy or independent uh, learning is uh, becoming more popular. We, we call it uh, Merdeka Belajar is a free yeah, freedom yeah, to study. Yeah, that is the uh, government's uh, program, uh, especially for undergraduate uh, students. Uh, I want to introduce Professor jo Jacobs actually, uh, especially on uh, his work, but it is uh, too long. <laughs> he is a very active uh, writer. Yeah, uh, so many articles that he has published yeah, especially on English language teaching and also books. Yeah. And I was trying to download yeah, his uh, CV. Yeah. And, and it is so, so long. Yeah. So many uh, publications that he uh, has published. They're very, very productive, very active until now. Yeah. Until now. And uh, we expect that this lecture will give uh, some ideas for our students because soon they will write the uh, thesis proposal yeah, for their uh, research proposal for their thesis. Yeah, we expect that they can be can write a, a quality, high quality proposal, uh, which can be published yeah, uh, in. Uh, a good journals uh, later. Uh, I think that is my short introduction. Uh, thank you very much again, Prof. Uh, George Jacobs, yeah, for your 
uh, time, for your uh, knowledge, for your availability uh, to give a lecture to our students. And let's uh, listen seriously. Let's watch this uh, presentation from Prof. Uh, Jacobs, and there will be video as well. Yeah, if we cannot show the videos, I have sent the link of the video uh, to the WhatsApp uh, groups. Yeah, you can uh, watch it by yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Professor George Jacobs, time is yours. Thank you very much, Prof. Safnil. Yeah, uh, Prof. Safnil is a very friendly person. Uh, on one of his visits to Singapore, he gave me uh, a batik shirt from from uh, from Sumatra. I wore it so much, I wore it out. So I can't wear it anymore, but I taught some Indonesian Air Force pilots in Singapore. I taught them English and they gave me this shirt. And I, people from Indonesia are very generous. So I have a big supply of batik shirts. Okay, uh, I think everyone already has all the slides. So, no need to worry about taking notes. Here's my contact. There's my email address. I've also got a website, you know, this academia.edu. Mm. So I've got an account there and many of my articles are there. So you can, you are most welcome to download all those for free. Lots and lots to read. And we have a special guest today from Malang, from State University of Malang, Dr. Francisca Maria Ifon. And um, I especially invited her because she and I are writing a book chapter about the topic of today's talk. So maybe she'll have some things to add to what I say or, uh, we can have more discussion after this. And when the book chapter is finished, which, which won't be until maybe September or October, I'll send it to Professor Safnil and he can give it to all of you. And I'll, I'll put it in my uh, academia.edu account too. So you can get it there. Thank you very much. And, you know, I'm into learner autonomy. And people just sitting and listening to a talk, that's not really learner autonomy. So I want you guys to be active. Now, we're not going to use breakout rooms. What we're gonna use is the chat, you know, the chat function in Zoom. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with that. So I'll ask you to use that chat function many times today. And please go ahead and share your ideas and experiences. Okay, let's start with a little activity. You know, we have superordinate terms and subordinate terms. So one superordinate term is sports played with balls. There are many of them like football, tennis, ping pong, squash, volleyball, sepak takraw, rugby, bowling, golf, cricket, all of those. Okay, so the superordinate term is sports play with balls. And the examples of sports play with balls are these 10. So now it's your turn. Student-centered methods and techniques, that's the superordinate term. So I, let's see if we can come up with 10 of those. I gave you some examples like, this morning, uh, uh, Dr. Yifan spoke at a webinar in Thailand about extensive reading and extensive listening. So that's one student-centered technique. Problem-based learning is another. Having students create their own books, that's another. And uh, Dr. Yifan has written an article about that. That's the URL for the article. So you can go online and you can, you can read that article. So what I'd like you to do now is in the chat, please add more 
student-centered techniques. Okay, group work. Yeah, that's group work, cooperative learning. That was, that, that is another student-centered technique. What are some more, please? There are many, many more. Project-based learning. Yeah, good one. Okay, problem-based learning, yeah. I think I mentioned that one already. Task-based, yeah. Task-based gets the students to be very active. Any technique that gets your students to be active, not just sitting there listening to you. Yeah, having the students do presentations, having, uh, getting them to do skits, yeah. Diary writing, also known as journal writing. That's one of my favorites I like to do. So every, every week or so, the students write about their experiences. Simulations, another good one. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so what is learner autonomy? So autonomy is our ability to make decisions and have a say in the direction of our lives. And one definition of learner autonomy is students taking charge of their own learning and using their learning to make the world a better place. So learner autonomy isn't just, I'm a learner, I want for myself. No, I'm doing this, I'm learning not just for myself, I'm learning for others too. And a key point is that autonomy is for everyone. It's, yeah, we're talking about learner autonomy, but everyone in society needs autonomy. And democracy is one way to promote autonomy for the citizens. And of course, everyone can be a student. It isn't just for children. And so what about you? Are you a lifelong learner? And do you exercise learner autonomy? Also, what about schools and teachers? How do they encourage learner autonomy? So first question on this slide is, what about yourself? Like, do you take any online courses? Do you choose? what you're gonna study? Do you choose how to study? And what about as a teacher or uh, when you were a student, what did your school do to help you be an autonomous learner? So again, please use the chat and share some ideas, either about the first question, what you personally do, to be a lifelong learner, even if you're 40 years old, a lifelong learner, you're going to continue learning, even if you're 80 years old. And what about in schools? 
what do schools do to promote autonomous learning? Okay, so letting students work in groups, that's uh, a good way. Uh, or I think what Safnil does, he goes on his own and finds articles to read in open source journals so that he can continue learning. Even though he's already a professor, he's not satisfied, he wants to continue learning. Yeah. I, I also do that. I use Google Scholar, I, I find articles, and then not all the articles on Google Scholar are available open source, but some of them are. Uh, orientation, somebody wrote orientation. What do you mean by orientation? Uh, yeah, pro Professor, uh, to me, I think uh, to promote learner autonomy, I think we need a specific orientation uh, to, yeah, in, in the school, right? Okay, so in other words, you let the students know what things they can do, how they can be an active learner, what resources are available to them. Or do you mean something else um, when you talk about orientation? Yeah, orientation. Uh... I think uh, it's not the actually the source, but the method at the beginning to promote the learner autonomy. Right. So the students feel more comfortable yeah. in the school or at the university. Yes. If they feel comfortable, yes. then they, yeah. The, go ahead. They they feel comfortable, and uh, we also make sure they are on the right track in learning. Yeah. Yeah, so, and somebody wrote, uh, writing about, the students write about their daily experiences, like reflection. Reflection is a great tool for promoting learner autonomy because we reflect on what's working for us, what's not working, what our weaknesses are, what our strengths are. And then we can move forward to try to build on our strengths and overcome our weaknesses. And, uh, Someone talked about using an app, Cake app. I don't know that one, but I know there's so many great apps out there that can really help us to, to uh, take control of our own learning. Nanda Tool, can you tell us what is this Cake app, please? Um, Cake app is an application that we can use to learn uh, some new expression. Um, so the application provides uh, the movie clip that consists of some new expression and oh. also idioms. Right. Nice. Yes. Movie so the, clip. yeah, that sounds like a fun way to learn. We've yes. got the video and yeah, so it's it's more fun and it's more it's more understandable. And uh, Ade talked about. Uh, providing engaging content and topics. So yeah, students want to learn about those. So that that's one that shows the students that learning connects with their lives, what their interests are, what's important to them, and that's going to be more engaging. 
Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint, but you guys are doing a really good job. Okay. okay, let's look at some myths about learner autonomy that some people believe, but I don't think are true. One myth is that learners are either 100% autonomous or not autonomous at all. Like most things in life, autonomy is like a continuum. It's not either or, it's not yes or no, it's partial. So yeah, we, we have students, we want them to become more and more autonomous as they go along. But autonomous students don't learn without teachers. Yes, sometimes they do, but teachers are still very important. Teachers guide students to become more autonomous. And okay, if students need help, we shouldn't believe in myth number three. If we help our students, that weakens their autonomy. No, we want to give them a chance first. They try on their own. But if they're still having trouble, then yes, we step in and we help them. So it's not, learner autonomy doesn't mean no teachers. Learner autonomy plus ICT definitely doesn't mean no more teachers. So we, you don't have to worry. You're not gonna be replaced by computers and learner autonomy. We're gonna have more fun because we can learn along with our students, just like Prof. South Mill is still learning. We can learn along with them. So they, they use the internet just like the Cake app. They, they learn, they teach us about these apps. We, we continue to learn. And some people, number five, some people think that only older students can be autonomous. That little kids, no, we, we have to tell them what to do. But remember that autonomy isn't either or, it's not 100% or 0%. So even preschool children can begin to become more autonomous. And some people think, myth number six, that autonomy is about doing alone. You know, you, you just live in a cave and that's not about it. That's not autonomy. Autonomy is definitely, sometimes you learn with teachers, sometimes you learn with peers, sometimes you learn alone. So that's why cooperative learning and learn autonomy can fit together. Because you know about zone of proximal development, Vygotsky and all that, Z, ZPD, or as they say in Singapore, ZPD. So it's all about scaffolding. It's all about support. So we can provide our own support. That's the learner autonomy. But peers can support us and we can support peers. Teachers can support us and we can support teachers. So it's a continuum. We need all of these. Now, let's look at motivation because no kind of learning is gonna work without motivation. And I'm sure everyone's heard of extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. What about teacher-centered instruction? Is that more extrinsic motivation or more intrinsic motivation? Can you just put your answer in the chat, please? Okay, so certainly teacher-centered is more associated with extrinsic because the teacher is the main motivator by praising students or giving them high grades, et cetera. But where does, why, why is extrinsic, why does it start with EX? And why does intrinsic start with IN? Can you use the chat? 
and answer that question, please. Why does extrinsic in extrinsic motivation start with EX? And why does intrinsic in intrinsic motivation start with IN? Let's see your answers in the chat. Yeah, everyone put extrinsic for the last question. So why is the X in extrinsic and the N in intrinsic? Right, X, because extrinsic motivation comes from X outside of us, external. And in, because it comes from inside, it's internal. Okay, so there are two two very famous researchers in motivation. Uh, one is Edward D.C. It's pronounced like Washington D.C. and Richard Ryan. And uh, D.C. made a, did a TED talk in 2012, but I only just saw it a couple months ago. And I said, wow, this video is so clear. So ever since then, I've been sharing it with people. So I want to share it with you. And it, he does, he calls intrinsic motivation autonomous control. That's why this is really appropriate for today's talk. Uh, we talk about learner autonomy and DC says that intrinsic motivation is autonomous control. So uh, uh, Pak Adin, can you, Play the video. Professor, Daphne, can you give me the uh, make me go house, Professor? Daphne? Okay. <laughs> uh, sure. Let me. Professor, Daphne, make me go house. Are the video can be. I am recording it. I think if I change the co host, uh, oh, I will okay. stop the, the recording. Okay, oh, maybe sorry. Burisma, uh, sorry. Burisma can Burisma. Uh, make uh, Adin the uh, co-host. No, no, uh, Prof. Sakmil, I have met you a host, so only you make me a uh, co-host. Oh, okay. Is it okay if I make you a... Uh... Co-host. Co-host? Not host, but co-host. Oh. So oh. I can start to share. Adin, Adin. The, okay. Uh, <clears throat> what is your name, Adin? Okay. Oh, a different name. Co host, yeah? That's wrong. Co host. Co host. Not host, but co host. Do you want to make the co host of this meeting? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You are now the co host. Great. Just done. This video is 14 minutes. Yeah. I really like it. If we don't get to watch it today, please try to watch it on your own because it's really got, it's really very clear on intrinsic and extrinsic, but it doesn't use, uh, it doesn't use those terms. Is it you in the video, Prof. Jacob? Definitely not. It's Professor DC. Oh, okay. But it's loading because my connection is not quite good, Prof. I think it will <laughs> take time. 
Perfect time. Bro. Okay, well, I think one solution is that all of you, all 40, 40 of you, mm. you all see the link yes. in the PowerPoint. You can yeah, all... I have shared the link in the Zoom. Yeah, that's right. You shared it also. So I think that's the best thing to do. Bagaimana beberapa orang Indonesia dapat menghasilkan lebih yeah. dari lima ribu dolar per bulan dengan hanya bekerja dalam piyama mereka? Is the, the, this is the ad, the ad, advertisement. The advertisement. Okay, go on. It's still loading. Oh, my connection and my house is bad. That's why. <laughs> Okay, this is it. Yeah, yeah, this is it. The sound is good. Mm -hmm. So you, you did this very well, Adin. Okay, thank you. So... I love motivation it's given me a good life and every place i look i see motivation or lack thereof so what is this thing i love this thing called motivation it's the energy for action it's what gets you up in the morning and moves you through the day Traditionally, psychologists, economists, people on the street have thought about motivation as a unitary concept. That is, they see it as something that differs only in amount. You can have less motivation or more motivation. And of course, our teachers, our bosses, our parents, want us to have more motivation for the behaviors they want us to do. It's a simple and straightforward way of thinking about motivation, and I have no doubt that if you measured the amount of a person's motivation, you could predict the amount of that person's behavior. But I've never believed that the amount of behavior was the most important thing. What I think is the important thing, actually, is the quality of behavior, not the quantity. And you can't get to that by looking at the quantity of motivation. Let me give you an example to illustrate the point. You have two women who work for you. Recently, you found a bunch of new material that seemed very relevant to your work. So you give the material to both of these women, and you ask them to spend two hours learning it. They do, and they both put in considerable effort. The first person goes through the material, and then through it again, and threw it again, and during the two hours, she memorizes every single fact that's contained within it. She did a lot of learning. But the second person reads it, and she's looking for the themes that are emerging. She's addressing it in a more conceptual way, trying to understand the big picture. What is this really about? And along the way, she learns a few facts, but she's interested in knowing how the facts fit together and how they relate to the big picture. The quality of their learning, even though it may have been exactly the same amount, was very different, and you can't explain that with the amount of motivation. For more than 30 years, my best friend Rich Ryan and I have been working on a theory of motivation called self-determination theory. 
SDT for short. And one of the central tenets of SDT is that you have to differentiate types of motivation. And the distinction that is most important for us is between controlled motivation and autonomous motivation. Controlled motivation is essentially the carrot and stick. When you're controlled in your motivation, you've either been seduced into behaving, perhaps by an offer of a reward, or coerced into behaving, perhaps by threat of punishment. But in either of those cases, you feel a lot of pressure. And within you is a sense of tension and anxiety. And all of those things have negative consequences for your performance and well-being. There's another thing about controlled motivation that's interesting. And that is that when your motivation is controlled, you tend to take the shortest path to the desired outcomes. Remember Enron? The directors of that company had the goal of making the company stronger and more productive. So they gave stock options to the top managers as a way of motivating them to achieve the goal. Well, those managers were pretty clever fellows, and it didn't take them long to realize that the shortest path to the outcome of making gazillions of dollars from their stock options was to artificially inflate the value of the company's stock. And we all know how well that worked out. In contrast, we have autonomous motivation. When you're autonomously motivated, you will experience a full set of volition, willingness, and choice about what you're doing. At the moment you're doing it, you're endorsing the doing of that behavior. Autonomous motivation comes in two flavors. The first has to do with interest and enjoyment. If you're interested in some activity and you enjoy doing it, the motivation is right there inside you, ready to come out and move you into action. Have you ever watched a two-year-old play? Two-year-olds love to play. And when was the last time you heard a parent ask, how do I motivate? my two-year-old to play? It's a silly question. The motivation is right there when you're interested and enjoy the activity. The other type of um, autonomous motivation has to do with your deeply held values held values and beliefs. If you really have something that's important to you, something that you truly value, you're perfectly willing to engage in the behaviors that are consistent with that. So both of these things, these two types of autonomous motivation, are all about being fully willing to behave. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds now of scientific investigations that have shown when you're autonomously motivated, your behavior will be more creative. You'll be a better problem solver. When you encounter obstacles, you'll be able to think outside the box and figure out what to do about them. Your performance will be better, particularly at heuristic activities, and your emotions will be much more positive. 
And very importantly, autonomous motivation is associated with both physical and psychological health. So, I'm arguing that autonomous motivation is a much more effective motivation than the carrot and stick, the controlled motivation. So what does autonomy support mean, which is the way of getting people to be more autonomously motivated? You begin by taking their perspective. If you're dealing with a child, with an employee, whoever it happens to be, can you begin by trying to understand how that person sees the situation? What is the internal frame of reference? And if you do that, you're in a position to move forward from there to do whatever it is that needs to be done. It also involves providing people with choice, allowing them to be engaged in the decision-making process. It means supporting their exploration, letting them try new ways, encouraging them to be self-initiating, to be a self-starter, if you will. And very importantly, if you're asking somebody to do something, you need to provide them with a meaningful rationale. Because that way, they will understand the importance and they may actually internalize it and make it a part of their value system. So what happens when people are autonomously motivated? When teachers are autonomously motivated, their students learn in a deeper, more conceptual way. The students enjoy learning more and they feel more confident and competent about themselves. When doctors are autonomy supportive, their patients live healthier lives. They take their medications more reliably, they eat healthier diets, and they exercise on a more regular basis. When coaches are more autonomy supportive, the research shows their athletes persist longer at the activity, they feel better about themselves while doing it, and they work together better as a team. When bosses are more autonomy supportive, their subordinates perform better at the job. They also are better adjusted in the workplace, which has important implications in terms of absenteeism, turnover, and so forth. And when parents are more autonomy supportive, their children have stronger mental health, they do better in school, and they cooperate more around the house. Now, all of these relationships that I've been talking about so far have an implicit differential in terms of authority. But many of our relationships aren't like that. We have relationships with peers. Uh, relationships I mean, you can stop the video now. Romantic relationships, our best friends. Arin, you okay, can stop okay. the there video are now. People that argue okay, my computer is that in order to have a high quality relationship, have you have to relinquish your autonomy in the service of the diet. Okay, I have stopped sharing. But in fact, okay. the research mm. shows. Oh, it's still playing. playing. Still playing. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, yeah, what I learned, I learned some things from that video. Like, one thing that I learned was about the, diff the two different types of autonomous motivation. One relates to our interests, what things we enjoy doing. Like, let's say I enjoy eating. So I'm willing to work hard, to go to the store, to buy ingredients, to come back, to cook them. I'm willing to put the effort in because then I enjoy the result. But another one, another aspect of this autonomous motivation is that what fits with my values something that I think is important. Like, 
about six months ago, I had a nephew who, who lives with my family and he got very sick. He had high fever, felt vomiting, all these things. So we didn't know, oh, maybe he has COVID. So uh, I went with him to the hospital, but I had to wait many, many hours at the hospital outside. And this was like starting from like 11 o'clock at night. So he didn't get diagnosed until 4 a.m. That was no fun. I didn't enjoy waiting outside the hospital. But, and it turned out actually he had dengue fever. He didn't have COVID. But uh, yeah, but I, that's, I think we have to take care of our family members. That's my values. So I'm willing, I'm willing to go through the, the pain of, of staying awake when I really, really want to sleep of not having my nice warm bed to sleep in, but I'm willing to do that. So I'm, because I'm motivated to help take care of my family members. So we have the interests and enjoyment, but we also have the values. And what DC says later in the video, we didn't get to see it, but he says that the job of teachers is to create the conditions. We have to have the conditions in our classrooms, in our Zoom meeting rooms or whatever, where the students can have their interests met, can enjoy and can do things that fit with their values. And they can have choice. Choice is very important as what, from what DC said. So how about if you take a minute, just use the chat. What's something that stood out for you in the video or any question that you have about the video? So please go ahead and use the chat to share about that. Okay, very important question. Where does intrinsic motivation come from? Other things that came out to people? Yeah. Yeah, motivation is energy to do But we can be motivated the control of others, what similar to we can be, we can have the autonomous. So we want to move away from the control using rewards or using punishment or threat of punishment to get students to do things. Maybe sometimes we need to use that, but we don't want to use it too much. And we want to try to, if we're using it now, hopefully we can move away from it. It's like extensive reading. Maybe our students don't want to read, but we can use rewards to encourage them to read. Our hope is that once they read, they're gonna enjoy reading so much, they're gonna find things that meet, uh, things to read that meet their interests. 
So they're going to continue to read on their own. Okay, let's go back to the to the PowerPoint. And let's look at the cooperative learning side of things. Because remember, we said that autonomous doesn't mean alone. So do you recognize this turtle? His name is Crush from Finding Nemo, the film from a long time ago. So, you know, I learned something interesting about turtles. Turtles are solitary, self-isolating animals. Like you don't see turtles swimming in pairs. They only come together for mating, but then the female will lay the eggs. I know that Malaysia has got a couple of beaches where the turtles come to lay eggs. I would guess Indonesia has some beaches like that too. Then, the turtle comes out of the egg and all by itself, the turtles swim into the sea and that's it. They're all by themselves the rest of their lives until they mate and then they're just together for a little while. The rest of their lives, they're alone. But what about you? Are you self-isolating in school? When you were a student, were you self-isolating or did you like to do what the kids in, this, in these photos are doing? And what about now? I know with COVID, we're supposed to be self-isolating, but we can, use, we can use Zoom, et cetera, to link with other people. So what about yourself? In the past and now, are you, were, were you self-isolating? Are you self-isolating? Or do you like to do things with other people? So go ahead and put your answer in the chat, please. Okay, some people like to play football with others. Let's like to do things with their friends, but sometimes can do alone, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I think this is an interesting point. Um, that sometimes it's a bit complicated to work with others. Yeah, I agree. So yeah, sometimes we have to go and do things alone. Like I'm working on a book project with two lectures from Surabaya, two professors from Surabaya, but I still have to do my part. So that's what I was working on earlier this afternoon working on my part, so I'm doing it all alone, but we're using Google Docs. So uh, they, they can read what I wrote and I can read what they wrote, but yeah. Okay, one person says they're an introvert, but I think 
introvert doesn't mean alone. It means that maybe you you don't like to be with a big group of people. You like to be with a small group. Because I'm 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 like that too. Okay, those were some very interesting responses. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. And okay, and so of course. There's a lot of benefit from teachers working together, like we see in the photo here. I know that it seems that being a teacher is a very isolated job. It's just you and your students. But actually, there's so many ways that teachers can and do help each other. We're going to skip the examples, but there are so many great ways for teachers to work together. So I know that it's actually, you know, uh, Professor Sakhnil was talking about a new initiative by the Indonesian government to promote students working together. But at least for the last five years, I know that the, the Ministry of Education in Indonesia and in many, many other countries has been promoting cooperative learning. So, there are many characteristics of good cooperative learning. One of them is that students communicate with each other frequently. They're, they're not just sitting together in a group, they're actually communicating with each other. And of course, nowadays, there's, they can use ICT to communicate with each other. So even if I'm not sitting with you, I can be communicating with you. Like I was talking about using Google Docs to communicate. So can you use the chat please to list what are some characteristics of good cooperative learning? Like you, you'll have a group of students doing group work. How do you know that it's, that it's going on well? So please use the chat and list some of the, the characteristics of good group work. Okay, willing to talk and share, very important. Some people worry that their group mates only want to get things from them. They don't want to share. A group processing, yeah, because they, the group needs to discuss how well is the group working together. That's, yeah, what, what, what can they do to, what, what, what is it the group can do to work together better? Okay, face-to-face -face promotive interaction. I can see that you're a fan of David and Roger Johnson. That's one of their phrases. Yeah, so basically what it means is they talk together, they, they help each other, they maybe disagree with each other uh, so that they can try to get better ideas. Like one person has an idea, another person gives an example of that idea. Okay. Um, uh, initiation, what does initiation mean? It's our same friend who likes orientation. Uh, I think initiation here, I mean, uh, when they want to share, they have to start. Uh, okay. <laughs> they have to, yeah. yeah, so they, they're, they're happy to share. Yeah. And if the group, not much is happening, then they will try to get things started. Yeah, very important. And heterogeneous members, like there are many kinds of, heterogeneity in groups, but one is that you've got the people who are high past achievers with the people who are lower past achievers so they can help each other. That's very important. Or yeah, students from different backgrounds work together in the same group so they get to know people different from themselves. And equal participation, yeah, I think, at least equal opportunity for participation. 
so that you don't have one or two people dominating the group. Everyone has a chance. So I'm, I'm quite impressed by you guys' background knowledge on cooperative learning. That's great. Uh, what did I do wrong here? So, okay. Here we go. So does cooperative learning smother autonomy? Okay, like if I'm in a group, well, I, I have to do everything my group says. I don't get a choice. I have to go along with the group. The group thinks this, I have to do that. That's what some people worry, but I say no. One thing that I didn't learn about cooperative learning because I've been reading about cooperative learning since maybe 1989, but it took me a long time to learn this, is that cooperative learning is not about the group. Cooperative learning is about each individual group member. Here's what I mean. Let's say that the group's task is to write a report. And we work together and we write a really good report. The teacher gives our report an A. Well, that's not good enough. The group isn't done until each of us working alone, maybe with a little peer feedback, could also write an excellent report that would get an A. Okay, a second reason why cooperative learning and learner autonomy can go together is what's called individual accountability. That means that everyone needs to do their fair share. So I cannot just let my group mates do everything for me. I've got to, I've got to stand up. I've got to do my fair share to help the group succeed. And then just like one of you mentioned, everyone needs a chance to participate. So we get the chance, then in individual accountability, we, use, we need to use that chance. So just because I'm in a group, like we're writing this book, it doesn't mean that I'm always with my, with my group members. Sometimes I'm by myself working on doing my fair share. And on one cooperative learning principle, which is similar to um, promotive interaction is called maximum peer interactions, where we work on quality interactions. So I'm not just repeating what my partners say, but I have to use my higher order thinking, you know, like Bloom's taxonomy. We have to do the processing group interaction, which one of you mentioned, where we talk about how well the group is working. And we need to use cooperative skills. And there are many, many different cooperative skills. Like one skill that I really like is called checking for understanding. And most skills have the nonverbal side, what they look like, and the verbal side, the words that we use. So like if I'm in a group and I wanna make sure that my group mate understands, I can use eye contact. I can lean forward. Uh, let me, yeah, my video keeps going off. Don't ask me why. I can lean forward like this to show I'm really interested in what my partner is saying. And let me get my screen back on. And what else does the checking for understanding look like? It looks like I have an interested ex expression. I care about what my partner, whether about whether my partner understands. And I can say, Please explain that to me, please. Can you show me? 
In other words, get them to show that they really do understand. How did you get the answer? Give me an example, please. So if we have, if the students have and use those skills in their cooperation, then their groups are more likely to work together well. Okay, I think we don't have time for this one, but there are so many more cooperative skills, at least a hundred different cooperative skills. Like for example, praising others, um, thanking others, encouraging others to participate, disagreeing politely, asking for reasons. And you know, in language, we've got different functions. So these cooperative skills fit very well with different language functions. So I think right now I'm gonna stop. We just have about 10 more minutes to uh, hear your questions, your experiences, any comments, et cetera. Well, uh, Prof. Jacobs, uh, Dr. Yvonne is here. Do you want her to say something? Uh, if she would like to, that would be great. Please, uh, Dr. Yvonne, if you want to say something. Good afternoon, everyone. everyone. So it's nice to be here, but I'm not at, I'm not actually prepared to to okay. present something in uh, about this particular topic. But yeah, um, I actually learned a lot from from uh, George's presentation today. You know about things like autonomy in relation to motivation and things like that. And um, I think many of us are um, unsure of what motivation actually are or what autonomy actually is. Sorry, yeah, what autonomy actually is. So it's basically like we, do, we are doing things just on our own, but autonomy is actually not, not like that. Yeah, and cooperative learning fits really well with um, autonomy and yeah, like can uh, I ask a question? I, I, yeah, uh, can I ask a question, I George? Yeah, yeah, sure. But let me just yeah. add to what you said. Yeah, so if Yvonne was saying that she learned some new things today, well, I just learned those recently, and I think it's a good example of how when we write, we learn. Writing can really help us. And I know that. Prof. Safnil exactly. said that a lot of you are going to be doing a lot of writing. So I think you'll also be doing a lot of learning. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Dr. Yvonne, yeah. please continue. <laughs> yeah, I have one question actually, George, and probably this is for everyone, yeah. Okay. So because, uh, because autonomy is, um, Basically, if we are talking about DC's um, idea of autonomy, we have two types of autonomy, right? Things that are from our own interest and enjoyment and things which are from our value, you know, the value of our lives. Right. Um, so how do we support autonomy in real life? And this is a big question actually, because I, I Right, uh, I don't really know how to answer the question. And so that's why I'm asking the question. So can, how can we support autonomy? Um, in, in extensive reading, extensive listening, this is an area that I'm familiar with. We support it by um, letting students choose their own books and then try to find things that they enjoy, improving their uh, confidence by you know, asking them to do what they can do instead of asking them, uh, asking them to do what they cannot do, you know, that sort of thing. So that's a part of uh, supporting autonomy, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. are there any other things that we can do? Similar things, perhaps? Well, from um, the experience of the students or from you, George. Right. Well, let me just do a quick advertisement. 
because uh, I'm uh, Dr. Willie, who, who uh, Dr. Yvonne presented with this morning and is a member of the board of the Extensive Reading Foundation. And they have a free online course about extensive reading. So I encourage everyone to go to the website of the Extensive Reading Foundation and sign up for that course. Okay, so extensive reading, yeah, like Dr. Yvonne said, one thing is we give students choice. They choose, they can choose. If they want to read a horror story, they can read that. If they like nonfiction about turtles, they can read lots and lots of books about turtles. And another part that Dr. Yvonne mentioned is that it's also about making it easy. So we don't ask them to read materials that are in their, in their panic zone, so difficult that they, that they can't understand them because then we kill off the enjoyment. And we find other ways to help them enjoy. For me personally, I like talking about the books that I read. For example, I just read this book, very interesting. It's called Undercover Robot, My First Year as a Human. So it's what they call a young adult novel. So it's, you know, it's not so difficult. It's not so thick. So it's about this robot who's developed by these humans and she looks just like uh, a secondary school student. And so she's trying to win a contest. Can she pass, she, can she go one whole year in her secondary school without anybody finding out that she's a robot? Now, I'm not gonna tell you what happens. You have to read the book. It's called Undercover Robot. It's, it's a fun book, although the ending is a little bit unhappy. I was disappointed. So anyway, I like to talk about it. So this one, one of my neighbors, uh, she's the one who recommended the book. So I, was talk I like to talk to her about it. So we provide this environment to talk about books. And then I mentioned earlier in my talk, the article that uh, Dr. Yvonne was the first author of, the article about how students can write their own books. So once we get going with reading, well, it's just natural that we're also going to want to do writing and we can write books that our friends will enjoy reading. So that's one more way that we can create this, this um, in climate where people like it. Now, uh, Dr. Yifan mentioned that Professor DC also talked about values and how that's important. So people can read books that are related to their values. For example, I recently read a children's book. You know, it's called um, Ralph, R-A-L-P-H, S, Mouse. Okay, it's about a mouse. It's not a true story. It's by a, a famous children's author. Her name is Beverly Cleary. C-L-E-A-R-Y, Beverly Cleary. It's about a mouse who becomes friends with this human boy and the boy's got a toy motorcycle and the, and the mouse learns to ride the motorcycle and has a lot of fun and a lot of adventures. Definitely not a true story because the boy and the mouse can talk, etc. But I think it shows how people treat other animals. So I was interested for that reason. So that fits with my values. And there's many other books like that. Like maybe one of the most famous is called Charlotte's Web, a, ve a very famous children's story. Charlotte's name of a spider. And she befriends another animal to keep that animal from being slaughtered. Okay, sorry for the long answer. Uh, Thanks, George. Sure thing. 
Uh, other questions or comments yeah. from anybody? Yeah, please. Questions? Yeah, from the students. Yeah, uh, George. Uh, mm -hmm. Our um, high school students are not independent. They depend on the teachers. If the teachers don't come to the class, they don't study. Yeah, and sure. They, I, I have a lot of students like that. Yeah. Yeah. When they move to university, they s s use the same uh, attitude. That's right. It's very difficult for to change that uh, that uh, attitude for uh, undergraduate students. So we are not only teaching them, but also changing their uh, attitude, educating them how to be more independent. You're right. And still, yeah, they are not independent because we have uh, big classes, we have uh, uh, limited resources, and it's difficult to control uh, 40 or 50 students in one class. Yeah. So is there any effective way uh, <laughs> to uh, make them more independent? Well, yeah, yeah that, that's why I put the thing about the myths concerning learner autonomy and how one of the myths is that it's either or. No, there's a mm -hmm. continuum. So okay. lots of students are down near the dependent side of the continuum, the non-autonomous side of the continuum. So we have to slowly change them. And just start with little things. That, that's one reason I like extensive reading. We, we give them a big selection of books. And have you heard about X readers? Yeah. X reader. X readers? Uh, no. Yeah. Dr. Yifon, can you uh, share about that? Because I think it's a great resource. Mm. Yeah. Please, Dr. Yifon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, X reading is the... Uh, uh, online library mm. for graded reading, graded readers. So it's full of graded readers. Okay. It's online. It uh, there are about one thousand three hundred books, if I'm not mistaken, available in that particular library. So we need to subscribe to that particular uh, platform, and students can um, what is it? Can choose books that they want to read anytime as long as they have internet connection because everything is online. So they have to read online mm -hmm. and their progress will be monitored so they can see their own progress. So X reading is in a way a very good platform because it gives learners the ability to choose as well as the ability to monitor their own learning. So for example, they, they have been reading level two for um, a month and they think that they're comfortable enough reading level three, then they can go to level three. Yeah, so, so it's so X so reading, like X, levels, yeah. the letter X yeah. reading. Mm. And how much does it cost per year? You were telling me it's quite reasonable, I think. Um, yeah, it is reasonable. It's $16 per person per year. Mm. Well, is, it, is it connected to any subject? Um. Well, it's, it's usually used for extensive reading purposes. So the topics are... Um, Very wide uh, ranging. Oh yeah, wide range topics like we have fictions and then uh, non-fiction. Yeah, it's just like if you have, uh, you, you know, you go to the big publishers that do the, the graded readers. So you have a, mm -hmm. a wide selection because I used it with a nephew of mine from Malaysia. So, yeah, he was able to find a lot of different books on lots of different topics, including, you know, the graded reader version of some famous books like he and I read Mark Twain's Prince and the Pauper. So yeah. I think it's um, and then you can use the M reader with with the X reading. Am I correct? Uh, you don't have to because the quizzes are already in X reading. Oh, is that right? Oh, great. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Right. So, so you can you can start that. That's one way. Or like another way is mm -hmm. 
I remember when I teach writing, my students are always asking me, oh yeah, okay, so I need to write an essay, but what topic? I just say, no, I'm not going to tell you what topic. You have to decide what topic. Mm -hmm. It's your essay. <laughs> so we have to, we, we shouldn't spoon feed students too much. And, but it all goes all the way back to how parents raise their children. Do they give them choice or not? Or like also like society, you know, some countries are a dictatorship. That's not promoting learner autonomy because the whole society, we want everyone to be autonomous citizens, to have control over their lives and to take part in making the society a better place. Just like learner autonomy isn't just about me, it's also about me helping others. Yeah, there is a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Oops. Could somebody read it because I can't see the chat. Okay. Right um, Thank you. Yeah, let me read it. I have a question. Uh, actually, I have experience when I taught students in elementary schools. Part of them have sensitive uh, personality, which they are jealous with their other friends who got a reward mm -hmm. from a teacher as uh, extrinsic motivation because they got high scores or can uh, or can answer the question so as a teacher what can we do to face the student who have this personality because sometimes i can decrease their motivation uh, to learn english is it negative effect uh, from extrinsic motivation thank you sure yeah because but I think the, my favorite answer to that question is when students work in groups, when they use cooperative learning, then instead of giving the reward to one group member, we mm. give the reward to the entire group. Mm. So let's say, for example, we, we give them some tasks to do. And as a group, they produce a good result. So we don't we don't praise one student, we praise the entire group. So, mm. yeah. so, so that way it's about the group. And so and if, if, if one group member um, does a lot to help the group, then the peers praise that person too. So the extrinsic motivation can come not just from the teacher, but from the peers. But students are more likely to succeed. And as Dr. Yifan was saying, we like doing things we can do well. And so students' success level will go up. Then they'll like doing the things that we're asking them to do to learn English. OK, yeah. Uh, Dr. Yvonne, can you uh, write the address for the free uh, extensive reading? sources in the chat oh, sure yes it's not the x reading it's something else yeah, okay so, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah but I, I got the one uh, this morning <laughs> that you shared <laughs> yes <laughs> yes i saw you actually professor yeah. yeah okay more questions oh i have a question yeah sri rahayu yeah please Yes, uh, thank you very much for the explanation. So uh, based on the previous explanation, uh, is it possible uh, for us to provide the autonomy in formal education as well? And could you please kindly explain more how to give the students autonomy? Uh, I didn't understand the first part of your question. Uh, how, is it possible to provide what, please? Informal education. Informal education. So, it, by it, informal, you uh, mean has, uh, not at a school? Uh, to the uh, professor Sapnil, um, was that questions before, sir? As I have uh, listened to your answer, I think uh, you said that if uh, it is 
actually possible uh, to provide the autonomy in uh, this kind of formal education. So could you please explain more about that? As I didn't catch the point already. Thank you. Okay, so informal education can take many, can, can happen in different ways, but informal education tends to be more voluntary, doesn't it? Because it's not like going to primary school. Students have to go to prime, have to go to elementary school. They have to go to secondary school. So, but um, informal and non-formal education is more voluntary. Like, like every Monday night, I take a course about rationality, how to be a rational thinker. And I signed up for that course by myself. I didn't have to. I'm not, I'm, it's free. I'm not paying for it, but I'm not getting a cert. I'm not getting a, a, I'm not getting anything from it just for my own interest. So I would think that informal education is a great way to promote the autonomous motivation. Okay, thank you. More questions? Please uh, uh, mute yourself and say your questions directly. Yeah, uh, Prof. Jacobs, uh, mm -hmm. do we have to uh, check whether our students are already uh, autonomous or not? Well, I think nobody is completely autonomous, you know, is, is a, no, nobody is completely autonomously motivated and that's okay. So we just, we just try to create the conditions like Professor DC said, we try to create the conditions. We try to have things that they enjoy doing, that they're interested in doing, that fits, that fit with their values. And by doing that, we're going to promote, uh, we're going to encourage them to be lifelong learners. So yeah, I don't, I think we don't have to hope. We don't have to test. We just, we just try to create the necessary conditions. Okay, uh, there is a question in the chat uh, from Axendro. Maximilian, <clears throat> uh, how if a situation uh, like this, when a teacher applies a jigsaw technique, mm -hmm. uh, if I am not mistaken, there is an activity that led the teacher to give the students a topic to be solved. I mean, the teacher uh, chooses the topic for the students. So what do you think does choosing a topic for the student uh, will uh, smother autonomy? Thank you okay. very much. Well, uh, in case some people don't know, Jigsaw is a famous cooperative learning technique. I'm a big fan of Jigsaw. In fact, I was just writing about it this afternoon. So uh, yeah. And there's a website by the person who developed Jigsaw uh, probably almost 50 years ago. I think it's called jigsaw.org. Um, the guy's name is Aronson, A-R-O-N-S-O-N. So anyway, it's like, again, it's a continuum. Life is full of continua. So how can you make Jigsaw more promotion, promoting of learner autonomy? Well, you can choose a topic that you think the students are interested in. So yeah, it, because in classically in Jigsaw, you take a text, you, the teacher, get the text, you break it into four parts, you give, uh, you put students in groups of four, one member has part one, one is part two, one is part three. Okay, that's, that's one way to make Jigsaw more autonomous. But Jigsaw by itself and cooperative learning by itself is already promoting autonomy. 
because ask yourself this, how would you normally teach that topic? You would normally as a teacher stand up in front of the class with your PowerPoint slides and lecture. But here you're not doing that. The students are teaching each other. So you're already promoting learner autonomy by using cooperative learning, by using Jigsaw. And all cooperative learning techniques have many variations. And one variation of Jigsaw is called bring your own piece Jigsaw. So in other words, instead of, let's say you're gonna talk about this person named Greta Thunberg, the person, the, the seven, I guess she's probably about 17 years old now from Sweden, who campaigns about climate change. So let's say you're going to have the students study about, about her, and you already know that they're interested in climate change. So you get them to go online and find their own information about Greta Thunberg instead of us finding it and giving it to them. Thank okay, you thank you. Yeah, this yeah. is, I think, the, the last questions. Yeah, we okay. are already 10 minutes more, Yeah, 15 minutes late. Uh, during the pandemic, yeah, we are teaching online, so we cannot yeah. see the students. So how, yeah. what can we expect from the students to be, uh, how do we uh, encourage the student to be autonomous uh, in okay. this situation? Well, let me give uh, Dr. Yvonne uh, a chance to answer that because she does a lot of teaching online. So uh, okay. I do a little bit, but she does a lot. So she knows more about that than me. Please, yes. uh, Dr. Yvonne. Very, yes, thank you. So this is a very difficult question because, um, well, I don't know how to answer it yet, but let me give it a try. Um, our students are so used to see us in front of the class so that when they do not have us with them, they, they are sort of lost. You know, so we have to find a way of bringing uh, our presence back. Yeah, and we can be present to them in many different forms, I think. Not physically, but by um, creating activities in which we can cultivate this autonomous learning. Yeah, so for example, um, by using technology. So one example is by, by using technology, students do uh, create, okay, the students read something, a, a story. Mm. Every group, uh, students in one group read one story and then students in different groups read a different story and then they create something out of the story, for example, poster or something. And then they do gallery mm. presentation in class. You know, something like that. So teachers need to be very, very creative during the pandemic and we have to be willing to do an extra, um, extra work mm. so that we can design something that can be motivating and fun at the same time without us being there. And that's that's the trick is basically that. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Yvonne. And yeah. if I, I can just- it answers the question, yeah. Thank if you. I can just quickly add, I'm a big believer in every little bit helps. Every little bit helps. So yeah, I fully appreciate that having to teach online is no, is very little fun, but so we just have to do the best we can. Any little bit we, we can move things forward is great. We're, we're not going to, we're, we're not going to get it as good as face-to-face, -face. but any, if we can do just a little, we're happy. So anyway, um, just to conclude, um, you know, autonomy is important in all areas of life. So for example, mm -hmm. my, my wife tries to be autonomous in terms of taking care of, our, of her health. She doesn't mm -hmm. depend on the doctor to give her medicine, everything mm -hmm. else. She goes and exercises every day. 
to keep in good shape. So I need to encourage her. I'm going to create the environment for her to enjoy exercising by going with her so she can talk to me while she's walking. So that's what I'm going to go and do. But let me just thank Dr. Yvonne for joining us and especially thank, thank um, Adin for getting the video to work and uh, Prof. Safnil for helping uh, to, for coming up with this idea, for inviting me. And I think Prof. Safnil is very lucky to have such knowledgeable students. I was really impressed by your knowledge of all these various topics regarding teaching. So it shows that he's got good students and he's a Thank very you. good professor too. Thank you very much. But Aswandi, uh, do you want to say something to close the session or as a question? It is a very long question, Paswandi. <laughs> Paswandi, I are you still in? Pak, please unmute the <laughs> Pak Aswandi. Yeah, Paswandi, you want to say something? Microphone is speaking, but uh, but you, you have to unmute. Uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please, please close the session, Pazwani. Thank you for, to everyone. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Professor Jacobs. Uh, it has been a, a long time, and Francisca, uh, me, Dr. Francisca, and my phone. Thank you very much for joining the session this afternoon. Thank you, Prof. Samir. Thank you, all uh, participants. I hope that there will be more uh, challenging. Uh, futures, more uh, interesting uh, presentations uh, will be uh, brought forward by Prof. Safnil and team in the near future. I hope everything uh, we learned today will uh, enrich our knowledge and our uh, field. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Safnil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, from Jacob, you, yeah, Dr. Yvonne. Yeah, thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, Pat. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.